This video is going to focus on the uh, evolution of the lymphatic system. Now, I, I'm making this for a class in comparative vertebrate anatomy, and this uh, lecture would be different if I was, say, making it for a genetics class. Here with the anatomy class, we're focusing on the anatomy, and the reality is that the lymphatic system doesn't have you know, a, you know, a huge number of anatomical structures associated with it. Uh, certainly there are lymphatic vessels. And so uh, in mammals like ourselves, uh, when a fluid leaves capillaries, not all of it returns at the other end of the capillary. And this is a problem because uh, over uh, the course of a day, uh, we would be losing fluid from our cardiovascular systems, a couple of liters, which did not return. Um, so we have another system of vessels, of lymphatic vessels, and small microscopic lymphatic capillaries collect this fluid from the tissue uh, fluid. And so uh, what then is inside this lymphatic capillary is termed as lymph. And then these lymphatic vessels start to fuse, just as veins do, just as you know, capillaries you know, form vein, uh, small venules, which form larger and larger uh, veins. The same thing is true uh, here, where these lymphatic vessels fuse, become uh, larger and larger, and then ultimately empty their uh, lymph into the lymphatic uh, ducts, which empty into the brachiocephalic veins. And so uh, this fluid was once part of the circulatory system. And here, as the brachiocephalic veins uh, form, the lymph is returned there once uh, again. Now, is this unique uh, to humans? Uh, it certainly uh, isn't. And you can find um, uh, lymphatic uh, vessels commonly in other uh, animals. Uh, here in the opossum, for example, uh, the uh, lymph is being returned to the um, a thoracic uh, duct, which empties into the brachiocephalic uh, vein. Um, but that being uh, said, the uh, evolution of these uh, lymphatic uh, vessels is a little uh, trickier. Uh, so uh, if we were to consider invertebrates, um, like let's look at this uh, fruit fly, for example, there's a heart that is um, pumping a fluid uh, outside of these vessels, but we can't call it blood because then then mixes with the coelomic fluid, and so therefore we can't really you know say here's blood vessels versus you know lymphatic uh, uh, vessels because we don't really even say that we have blood. There's just the blood stuff and regular fluid stuff is uh, is mixing. Um, uh, the jawless fish and the cartilaginous fish do not seem to have separate lymphatic vessels the way that uh, the higher vertebrates uh, do, although they have these thin walled sinuses uh, which collect fluid and empty them into uh, veins, which you know may be about the same. It's also of note that the lining of blood vessels in the jawless fish looks more like the lining of lymphatic vessels in the higher vertebrates than it looks like the lining of uh, blood vessels. And so lymphatic vessels uh, appear uh, first in the um, bony uh, uh, vertebrates uh, that we recognize that, you know, true set of lymphatic vessels. If we were to then consider other uh, lymphatic uh, structures, uh, certainly white blood cells can cluster in lots of uh, places uh, and, let's start here, uh, and uh, fight uh, microbes. And then so uh, there can be, you know, in diverse organisms, you know, a cluster of white blood cells. It doesn't have to be homologous. Um, when we think of, say, the tonsils, uh, this single tonsil, the pharyngeal tonsil or the adenoid uh, tonsil, um, it's present in reptiles, birds, and mammals. Um, and amphibians may have a region which is homologous to this. So this um, is an older structure. These pairs of tonsils, the pair in the soft palate, the palatine tonsils, uh, the pair in the tongue, uh, the lingual tonsils, they are only known in mammals. And so uh, the lymphatic structures of humans are not unique to humans, but they've evolved over uh, time. And as we you know, proceed to the groups, which are more and more closely related to humans, going from, you know, say, the bony fish to reptiles to, uh, to uh, mammals, the lymphatic systems are becoming more and more uh, similar. Uh, when it comes uh, to uh, lymph 
nodes. Uh, lymph nodes are those uh, structures uh, which can then be uh, associated with these lymphatic vessels and they can then screen the lymph. They can filter the lymph and look for um, uh, and uh, look for uh, sites of uh, infection. Um, uh, really only mammals have an abundance of uh, these. Uh, once again, uh, they seem to be present in amniotes, uh, but you know, once again, we could argue a bit over uh, homology. Uh, so a large number of lymph nodes where white blood cells are filtering the lymph that comes in through the afferent vessels before it leaves through the efferent uh, vessels. These are um, really only common in, uh, uh, in mammals. So, you know, if you were uh, to look in, you know, a, um, a, a, an opossum or a cat, we, we could find them in uh, homologous uh, regions. Uh, the largest anatomical structure in the uh, lymphatic system is the spleen. Uh, so there's only one spleen, it's on the left side of uh, the uh, body, and it has both a uh, red pulp where old red blood cells uh, undergo phagocytosis and uh, white blood cells uh, undergo, uh, and white blood cells are now filtering um, blood the way um, that uh, in a lymph node you might filter lymph. Um, the jawless fish do not have a spleen. Uh, they seem to have diffuse uh, tissue just along the GI tract, which performs uh, this screening function. But all of the jawed vertebrae starting in the shark. So here you can see a, uh, the, uh, the spleen of uh, a shark, once again on the left side under the stomach. Uh, you can see uh, the uh, spleen of a frog, the spleen of uh, a chicken uh, uh, here. Uh, um, the spleen of an opossum, etc. So uh, this is the largest lymphatic structure in all of the jawed vertebrates. It's always about in the same place, and it has both a red and a, a white uh, a pulp. So here uh, it is in um, in humans. Um, so once again, there's a red pulp where red blood cells are broken down, a white blood a white pulp uh, where white blood cells uh, perform the phagocytosis of uh, microbes, and if you were to look under the uh, microscope at the spleen of the frog. Um, then you would uh, find not only, you know, is it about the same uh, places performing the same uh, function, uh, but also you would see that it has then both a red uh, pulp uh, where uh, white, uh, where red blood cells undergo phagocytosis, um, and then uh, a, a white uh, pulp uh, where white blood cells are screening the blood for uh, infection. Uh, and so uh, the spleen is the largest lymphatic st uh, structure in the jawed vertebrates, and it performs a uh, homologous uh, function. Um, there are certainly other uh, lymphatic uh, structures uh, which we could uh, uh, consider. Uh, the thymus is of great uh, importance because it's here that the T lymphocytes are um, uh, are trained uh, to uh, recognize the difference between self and non-self and help facilitate you know, other parts of the immune system. Clearly other animals have a thymus, um, but this has evolved over uh, time. Jawless fish only have, um, they have an area you know, uh, which may be performing thymus-like functions. They have uh, cells which aren't true lymphocytes, um, but they have some of the characteristics of lymphocytes. And so uh, while you know, human immune structures aren't unique, um, they, uh, uh, the human immune structures don't occur in all of the vertebrates. They've evolved over time with once again, jawless fish not having true lymphocytes, but having things which seem to have some uh, features of the uh, lymphocytes. Um, other uh, structures, you know, we could say the same. Uh, so when we look at the appendix uh, attached to the large intestine of 
uh, of humans. This is a very recent development uh, in the lineage which connects humans and chimps. The end of the large intestine used to have a larger cecum when there was more plant material included in the diet. Um, so the cecum used to be much uh, larger, as you can see, you know, in you know a, a typical mammal. Um, and so, um, and so look how big the cecum is, you know, here in the opossum. And then in the human lineage, it was uh, constricted, uh, but then some of that uh, tissue kept its immune function since there's, you know, a great number of immune cells in all sections of uh, the uh, GI tract. And, and so uh, the uh, remainder of this ancestral uh, cecum uh, was retained only for its immune function. Humans and chimpanzees uh, have it, um, but it is absent in other uh, animals. And so, uh, you know, the uh, immune system, uh, the, the lymphatic uh, system has clearly uh, evolved as far as its anatomical structures. Um, another question that could be asked is uh, referring to then the white blood cells and immunity. This is a fascinating uh, question, uh, but once again, very quickly, I think this would leave the uh, material which is typically covered by an anatomy class and then get more into, you know, a physiology or, or a genetics class. So let me just, you know, make a couple of brief uh, statements. Um, white blood cells are incredibly complex. And one could argue that some of the aspects of uh, you know, white blood cells, such as humoral and cell mediated immunity are the second most complex part of the human body, second only to the, the functioning of the brain. Um, so how could such complexity evolve? Some have even argued that these are you know, so complex that you know, there's no way that it could uh, uh, evolve. You can't evolve complexity. Well, there are lots of different kinds of white blood cells. In, um, at a basic level, white blood cells are amoeboid cells which eat microbes. And you know, such cells go back to amoeba. So long before there were even animals, there were amoeboid cells that could perform phagocytosis. Um, even in the primitive animals known as sponges, which lack true tissues, they have amoeboid cells performing phagocytosis. Um, and so that is, uh, you know, uh, you know, so that type of white blood cell is ancient. Now, uh, because humans want to fight against so many different kinds of invaders, we have different kinds of white blood cells, as do uh, other uh, organisms. So if you were to look at whether it be fish or turtles, you know, etc., you clearly have different types of white blood cells in their circulation. Some are granulocytes, which have many of the same features as, say, neutrophils. Then there are big cells, which have features of uh, the uh, monocytes. Um, there's a type of cell in the human immune system called NK cells. They are not lymphocytes, but they're close. These actually go back to invertebrate chordates like tunicates uh, that have NK cells. Um, the jawless fish seem to have cells which are similar to lymphocytes, but not quite. Once again, they don't have a thymus uh, where T lymphocytes would need to uh, mature. Um, the jawed vertebrates have uh, and, and once you get to the jawed vertebrates, so here you can see something looking like a basophil with granules. Um, once you get to the jawed vertebrates, you have true lymphocytes, which can touch MHC proteins on a cell, an ID badge, and distinguish between self and cell uh, and non-self. You have uh, antibodies, uh, you have uh, lymphocytes, which can make antibodies as of the jawed uh, vertebrates. Uh, and so uh, this, uh, has uh, evolved uh, over uh, time. Now, one of the ways I like to uh, depict uh, this is if you were to take, say, all of the, the things that make the human immune system work, it's incredibly complicated, all right? So how, you know, does uh, this uh, work? Uh, and then, add, you know, like, let's list a couple of uh, uh, of things and say, what organisms share this? So for example, our immune system de depends on molecules uh, like this, which you know are molecules for adhering to each other, immunoglobulin like uh, proteins, the immunoglobulins uh, would be important uh, domains obviously for antibodies. Uh, well, these are known in eukaryotes. 
So eukaryotes evolved some of the proteins which humans need in their immune system. If you were to look at the very first animals, you know, including sponges, which are very simple, they have these molecules which are used in the complex uh, human uh, immune system. And as you go through you know, the various groups, when we get to metazoan animals, you, you know, there are even a few more uh, of the uh, components. Uh, when you get to bi uh, bilaterally symmetrical uh, animals, you're getting even more uh, components. Uh, when you're getting uh, to uh, the higher bilaterians, uh, you're getting uh, more. Uh, by the time you're getting to uh, deuterostomes, um, you're getting uh, more. <coughs> Uh, once again, uh, as you start getting into uh, the chordates, uh, you know, we're, um, you know, getting, uh, you know, even NK cells um, uh, by uh, the jawless uh, fish like hagfish and uh, lampreys, uh, the next one. Uh, you don't have all of the complexity that you will see in the jawed vertebrates, all right? You have lymphocyte-like cells instead of true lymphocytes. Uh, uh, etc. The jawed vertebrates now have the MHC proteins, which allow for the distinction between self and non-self. They have antibodies, uh, etc. So here's one way of looking at it and, and to see clearly complexity has evolved because complexity isn't an all or nothing situation. It's not as if you have, you know, uh, all of the components of complex pathways or you have none of them. Because as we go through here, tetrapods, you know, um, uh, arms or let's say, let's say bony fish had a few more than the cartilaginous fish do. Uh, amniotes have a few more features that were lacking in uh, the uh, tetrapods. Uh, uh, mammals, including the egg-laying mammals, have uh, a few more, like the different kinds of antibodies uh, uh, given uh, there. Uh, the live birth mammals have uh, a few more. So clearly in this sense, the complex pieces um, at which uh, uh, the human immune system depends on has have evolved slowly uh, over a time. Um, but then there's another way that I could uh, look at this. And so let me, uh, you know, perhaps pick uh, one of the most, um, uh, the complex features. So one of the most complex aspects of the, uh, one of the most complex aspects is what's called the complement cascade. After antibodies bind to antigens on the surface of a microbe, it attracts this huge set of uh, proteins where one activates the next, which activates the next. And at the end of this process, a pore is formed in the microbial uh, membrane, uh, which will then kill the uh, microbe. If you were to look at some of those components of the complement cascade, which work in this incredibly complex human set of immune reactions, you know, using antibodies, et cetera, clearly this has evolved over time because some of the pieces predate uh, not only these complex immune reactions, but for example, lampreys, which don't make antibodies, do have homologs of these genes, which are very important in how antibodies function. And so it's not as if all of the pieces of this complex immune reaction had to appear at once. Um, if you look at primitive uh, animals, which lack, you know, the complex uh, human uh, immune cascades, nevertheless, they have pieces of uh, these and they are uh, performing uh, different functions in immunity. Uh, in fact, uh, when antibodies uh, then uh, bind uh, to a, a microbe. This can not only uh, activate one pathway of an immune cascade, but multiple pathways, some of which are simpler than others. And so it seems that these complex immune cascades were built upon each other. One was very simple, and then more complex ones then were added to an already functioning system um, which uh, existed in more primitive uh, vertebrates. And so once again, this enters now more into the realm of uh, genetics as we start to compare uh, the uh, genes used in the immune system from one vertebrate uh, to another. But then suffice it to say uh, that while uh, humans are not unique, where our immune complexity, so here you can see an alternate pathway having only you know, these three steps being much simpler 
than uh, the um, uh, uh, the uh, original one that I had uh, shown. Uh, so it, it seems that uh, these immune pathways have been built over time. Um, one significant point was at certain points uh, in you know, various lineages, it seems that uh, the genome was duplicated, that a genetic accident not only say added another chromosome or a block of a chromosome, but a whole new set of chromosomes. This seems to have happened twice in um, uh, all of the vertebrates and then separate times in different vertebrate lineages. Uh, but um, uh, in the jawless fish, perhaps giving rise to the first fish, and in the uh, ancestry of the jawed vertebrates. And thus, when we ask, you know, why is, say, uh, the immunity of the jawed vertebrates more complex than those of the jawless vertebrates, they now had a, a double the number of genes after a genome duplication. And so then more uh, complex functions were then assigned uh, to some of these um, some of these proteins. So what was once one immune cascade now existed as a double and one could now specialize more in clotting while the other one more in uh, immunity. And so uh, the lymphatic system itself does not have a great deal of anatomy. So this has been uh, short focusing on the lymphatic vessels, the spleen, the thymus, et cetera. Um, but the, uh, the molecular functions of the immune system are fascinating. And once again, all showing uh, the gradual um, evolution of those systems uh, in vertebrates.